have not, I have not been in, on this stage to welcome a crowd of members in way so long. I don't, actually, I don't even remember. It must have been 18, 19, 20 months ago. Now, we've had one, one program, and of course, last week, for those of you who were lucky enough to come to Fine Arts and Flowers, we kicked off with a, a gala. Our council um, had 800 people here for the gala, and then we had tens of thousands of people over the four-day weekend. I mean, it was, it was very extraordinary, unbelievable. So I'm Alex Nardis, director of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And what's really interesting, though, tonight, as good as the crowd is here, we have more people online watching this lecture than we actually had here in person. And what we found out during the pandemic, it's, it is, it's incredible. What we found out during the pandemic is that although we'd had online programs for years, no one came. And although our attendance here dropped precipitously during the pandemic, until people were vaccinated and, and the numbers picked up, our online audience grew by hundreds of thousands. In fact, the year that just ended June 30, between on-site attendance, attendance at our partner museums where we've sent exhibitions and programs, and then our online program, 1.8 million people participated last year here at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, which is an incredible number. Well, we're delighted that you're here because um, this is a long time in coming and had nothing to do with the pandemic. The closure of the Mellon Galleries for almost four years was precipitated because in 1984, when the building was built, the Lewis and the Mellon Wing, the substrate below the floors, behind the walls, and in the ceiling, we put plywood, which we normally do, so you can hang paintings. Obviously, the flooring to be able to support whatever goes on top of that. Well, the flooring was impregnated with a fire retardant that over time turned to mush. So if you ever actually had the experience, and I did, and were walking through the galleries, you would hit soft spots in the carpet and literally sink. That's because the, the flooring was actually bend, bending on the uh, plywood that did not exist anymore. We did the renovation of the Lewis Galleries while we were doing the expansion and renovation and the opening of the uh, McLaughlin Wing. That was in 2008. But we ran out of time and logistics to be able to do the other half. So when we finally were able to do that, and mind you, it was about a million and a half dollars to tear everything out and put it back pretty much exactly as it was. The difference being, and this is where we got to be very lucky, because uh, in that process, um, we hired a new Mellon curator of European art, uh, a new head of our European collection, uh, and it happened to be somebody we knew. Uh, Sylvain Cordier had worked with us on several exhibitions that he had curated that you, I hope, got to see. They were absolutely spectacular. Rodin, and then the Napoleon exhibition, both of those which traveled and came here. So Michael Taylor, our deputy director, chief curator. Uh, oh, and by the way, if, if you have not seen Man Ray yet, we have our member previews starting tomorrow and Friday from 10 to 9, both days, and I encourage you to come back. Michael has done an extraordinary job at creating a special exhibition, a view of, of Man Ray's Paris during those crazy years of the 20s and 30s up to 1940, and it is one of the most exciting exhibitions we have ever done. So come back, uh, it, a member's preview only for the next couple of days. Anybody who's not a member, just join and you get all the benefits of membership. Uh, three, did I mention 365 days a year? 365 days a year, the only art museum in America that's open with free general admission every day bar none. 
except, of course, for the three and a half months we were closed during the pandemic. But we won't, we won't go back to that. So, yeah, really. Silvan, Silvan came to us uh, and had the ability to reimagine the Mellon collection. He's done unbelievable work with that collection. First of all, we flip-flopped the galleries, the floors. The sporting art, which had been on the second floor, has moved to the third floor. The French collection has moved to the second floor. And let me tell you how important that is. With the renovation and expansion that we are working on now, we're going to be adding about 170,000 square feet of museum, about the same as the McLaughlin Wing. We're going to be renovating all the 1970 buildings and all of what is now African and special exhibition where you see the Ansel Adams exhibition. That space will become galleries for the European Art Permanent Collection. Now, what you might not know is that in the back of the wall, the back wall where Ansel Adams is, you see a wall. Right in the middle of that wall, there's actually a door behind the wall. If you go into the galleries this week to see the Mellon Collection, what you will see in the second floor, in the middle of the wall that backs up to the 1970 wing, the other side of that door, which has now been uncovered. What's going to happen is the European collection, when we finish with this expansion and renovation, will occupy the space where Ansel Adams is now and all the rest of that south wing. And so you'll go from non-Mellon French painting and European art through a doorway into the Mellon French collection. We've never had the ability to show all of our great French pictures, Mellon and non-Mellon together. And let me tell you, when you see them together, here in the near future, you will be wowed because both collections are outstanding. But to be able to finally marry them together is going to be a feat that's extraordinary. Now, Sylvain um, is a native Parisian. Uh, his PhD is from the Sorbonne. Uh, he came to uh, Montreal to be the head of decorative arts and, as I mentioned, did those uh, exhibitions that came here uh, to Virginia, and then we were fortunate enough to steal him away. And he has done what I will say, and, I, and I'm going to try to find a nice way of saying this about the, the Mellon collection of sporting art. It's, a, it's the world's best and largest collection of sporting art. It's never looked this good. In fact, it's the first time it's so engaging that even people not interested in sporting art are going to enjoy it because it is absolutely stunning. The French collection is so beautiful and makes Mr. Mellon's collection look so much better than ever before in the 36 years that we've had it on display that you're going to be astonished. In fact, you're going to see works of art that have been hanging there for decades that you've never seen before like this. And that's due to the curatorial genius of Dr. Sylvain Cordier. So please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Wow. <laughs> uh, Alex, what, uh, what an introduction. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm very touched. Thank you very much for, for your kind words. Um, this... Um, I'm very, this is very exciting for me to, um, oh, you've, you've disappeared, <laughs> the, the lights have just, <laughs> um, it's, it's really very exciting for me, obviously, to finally see the Mellon Collections um, reopening and, and tonight to share this, this fabulous project and, and this ambitious uh, adventure that it has been over the, the past two years. Um, the, um, the point of this lecture tonight is uh, not really to uh, be a lecture on art history. I think we have a program that's coming up of classes on Impressionism and on, on sporting art that you're, of course, very welcome to register to in the coming weeks. Um, the, my, my hope, my aim tonight is more to sharing some, some thoughts and, and some reflections that we've had as a team here as VMFA 
uh, around the ambitious project that um, uh, this reinstallation of the Mellon collections have, have been. So tonight the idea for me is not so much to talk as, uh, as an art historian, but really as someone who has been uh, I think deeply um, moved uh, by uh, what has been probably the most exciting curatorial experiences of, of my career. Um, the, uh, um, of course, as you know, Paul and uh, Bunny Mellon are uh, some of the most iconic collectors of art, of European art in particular, in uh, the USA of, of, uh, of the 20th century. And here again is not the time uh, to um, present in detail the uh, extensive, extraordinary uh, lives and, and personalities of, of uh, Paul and Bunny Mellon. I think VMFA has hosted quite a lot of uh, talks and presentations about how uh, extremely influential and fundamental this couple of collectors have been for uh, VMFA and how much VMFA benefited tremendously from their, um, their philanthropy. As you know, Paul Mellon has been for um, uh, nearly half a century um, um, a member of, of the board, including uh, uh, decades of being president of, of the board of, of this museum all along the, the first per period of its life. Um, and, uh, and of course, I, I will just very briefly mention the fact that uh, VMFA benefited from their philanthropy as well as very iconic fundamental institutions uh, such as the National Gallery of Art, of course, and uh, the uh, Paul Mellon Center for British Art uh, of uh, uh, Yale, as well as, of course, the Andrew Mellon uh, Foundation, uh, which is uh, still doing a tremendous job uh, nowadays. Um, the gift of their collection, of Paul and, and Bunny Mellon's collection to uh, VMFA, started after he retired from the board in uh, 1979. And it took uh, five years to build and finally inaugurate in 1985 the, the, the West Wing, this, this expansion that was intended to receive both the Mellon collection and the collection uh, of uh, modern and contemporary art and decorative arts of uh, Sydney and Francis Lewis. Um, and, and then after the inauguration of the initial gift of the Mellon collection to uh, VMFA, we um, witnessed a sort of continued process of enrichment of the, this initial gift until Paul Mellon's death in uh, 1999 and then after uh, Bunny Mellon's death in 2014. And as uh, Alex mentioned, it's a, it's a period that I didn't know uh, at, uh, at, at, at VMFA, but there was all this discovery of some kind of structural issues that uh, Alex has, been, um, has mentioned uh, that just called for a vast project of uh, restoration of, the, of, of this, of the Mellon part of, of the West Wing in the late uh, 2010s. Um, it's, and, and that was, uh, of course, an invitation to redo the building in, in, in many ways to ensure the stability of the building. It was also an invitation to rethink the display and interpretation of the collection. And in, it is, as Alex mentioned, it is in that context that I um, very happily uh, joined uh, the, the VMFA uh, in, in 2019 for a project that, that was supposed to start right away for, for me. And as you probably know or, or remember, the initial intention was to open, reopen the Mellon Galleries in October 2020, but, uh, COVID happened, and uh, we had to postpone by a year uh, to October 2021 this um, uh, this reopening. It was it was frustrating, I think, at, at at the beginning when we finally had to take that decision. But it was definitely the good decision to take, um, and it proved to be extremely interesting from a curatorial perspective. Like you know, gaining a, a complementary year into rethinking uh, a display is something that rarely happens in uh, our industry, and so it's, it's, it, was, uh, it was actually much more uh, uh, a gift than, uh, than any, anything else. Uh, it's been a fabulous, really, really fabulous project um, that um, invited me to address 
uh, with an, an amazing team uh, of, of professionals that we have here at VMFA, many exciting challenges in terms of interpretation of the collection, in terms of display, in terms of, of, of thinking a scenography that would both respect the spirit and the intention of the uh, collectors that Mr. Ma uh, Mr. and Mrs. Mellon uh, were, but also to kind of help it, help it uh, enter into the uh, 21st century. Um, I mentioned the, the, the extraordinary team that we have, and really as part of this introduction, uh, I have to express my immense uh, gratitude to all of the colleagues here at VMFA that have dedicated so much of their energy and their talent to uh, making this happen. It, it really does take so much um, to turn a, a curator's vision, which is something that is just stuck into, um, in, into a curator's brain, into a reality, and nothing would have been possible. Uh, with, uh, without so many of uh, this, um, this, the, the, the members of this great team that, that we call the MFA. Of course, the exhibition and design department, people in education and uh, editing, our amazing team of conservators, um, and of course, our uh, curatorial department, and uh, including someone I really want to thank tonight uh, is my assistant curator of European art, and the Mellon Collection, Dr. Colin Yarger, who has been really extremely um, uh, helpful uh, in, in, in this um, uh, huge adventure. And of course, I also want to, uh, it's, it's my turn to thank Alex for his support and our amazing chief curator and deputy di director for art and education, Dr. Michael Taylor, for his continued support in, uh, in this big project. It really means a lot to me to, to say that tonight and, um, um, and as, as part of, of this introduction. I also mention, um, and I will mention them uh, later in the, in, in the presentation, the extraordinary team of art handlers and uh, registrars that we have uh, in, uh, in this museum without whom nothing would really ha have been possible. Um, the, natu the nature of, of the Mellon Collection, um, it's, uh, the Mellon Collection that we have here in, in, in VMFA is composed of three main uh, entities, um, and, and I want to say three main stories of, of collecting. The first part is an extraordinary ensemble of French paintings running from the age of late Romanticism, so for the, the age of uh, uh, pre-Impressionism to uh, Modernism, so roughly from the 1860s up to the uh, uh, early 1950s. And it corresponds initially to Mrs. Mellon's, so Bunny Mellon, uh, Francophilia that she uh, brought her husband, the Anglophile um, uh, Paul Mellon, to, to like. And, I've always been very interested in uh, looking at the French collection, what we call Mellon French, as um, their uh, collecting activity together as a couple, mostly b between the, from the period of, of their marriage. They got married in 1848, so from the 50s and, and the 70s ma mainly. Um, the second um, section of the collection is, of course, the very unique collection of uh, sporting art, mostly British, but also uh, French in, in, in a smaller part, French and also American, that runs from the early 18th century up to the mid 20th century. Um, the sporting art collection, as you probably know, is, was really his passion as a horse, and, horse enthusiast and a great Anglophile uh, himself. And it's a collection that he started as, actually as a young man uh, in the 1930s, and it's, it's very interesting to connect it to his own um, uh, connection to uh, England. As you know, his mother was um, an, uh, an English uh, woman herself, and there was always this extraordinary Anglophilia on, uh, on his part that he um, um, uh, cultivated until the end of his life. And the third um, part of the collection that we uh, display at VMFA is a fascinating fascinating collection of jewelry uh, designed by Jean Schlumberger for Mrs. Mellon, mostly in the 1960s and 1970s, and which is the result of, of, of an extremely interesting uh, creative collaboration between a designer and a patron in uh, the uh, glamorous age of late surrealism extravaganza of, of, the, of the 1960s and 70s. 
um, rethinking, so re-envisioning the presentation of this collection supposed, I think, to reflect on the logic of those uh, uh, collections. So thinking about their diversity, their complementarity, their relation to each other, and the variety of stories that could help us talking about European art as the encyclopedic museum that uh, we uh, are, and also maintaining, keeping the project of talking about the melons themselves, like contributing, continuing to um, uh, celebrate their uh, legacy as uh, art lovers, collectors, and benefactors of the uh, institution. And as uh, Alex mentioned, and I'm going to um, uh, be, be brief about that, an early decision that I propose based on the first reflections around this idea of complementarity and diversity of these different collections was to switch floors uh, compared to the uh, previous, the old presentation um, of, of the Mellon collection. The old presentation supposed that sporting art was on the second floor and that impressionism, Mellon French, uh, was on, on the third, and now uh, you, you'll notice that indeed we, we have the opposite with Impressionism on the second floor and with, um, do I, yeah. um, uh, so on the second floor, uh, fr Mellon French, so pre-Impressionism, Impressionism, post-Impressionism, post and Modernism, and uh, on the third floor comes the association of, uh, so, sorry, uh, sporting art and the Schlumberger uh, Gallery. Uh, the reason was that, um, um, first of all, I wanted, I, I was very um, um, interested in the idea of inviting the, the public to experience the art that they collected together as a couple, which as I was mentioning earlier was mostly the French uh, uh, collection, uh, before inviting the public to experience the specificity of their own individual taste, so which so on on the third floor, uh, which is uh, sporting art for him and Schlumberger for uh, for her. The presentation on the second floor, so what we call what I keep calling Mellon French, uh, has been reorganized around a chronological progression, in order to understand for the for the public to understand the succession of artistic movements succeeding each other between the mid 19th century and the mid 20th century in, uh, in, in, in France in order to really emphasize this, this long um, succession, um, a taking on of different artists, different movement, uh, inspired by the precedent generation or in, in contradiction to the precedent generation and to try to, to try to create a display that would make that as clear as uh, possible what the different generations took, were able to took or to contradict from, from the earlier. Um, as I'm saying, so the purpose here tonight um, uh, is, is, is not to do really an art history class, but so I'm, I'm going to go rather uh, quickly in presenting the different sections of uh, this, uh, this, this gallery. Um, we begin with the pre-impressionist gallery, which is mostly uh, focusing and dedicated to landscape painting in the 19th century France. That's kind of a, an introduction to uh, some of the concepts that were to play such a, an important role and with the works of artists who were to play such an important role on the following generation of uh, the uh, Impressionist painters themselves. Then we move on to the second gallery of that uh, display, which is really dedicated to the, the, the uh, most important phase of, of the Impressionist um, uh, movement. We are lucky in the Mellon Collection to enjoy so many uh, masterpieces by some of the most iconic representatives of uh, the uh, French Impressionist movements. Of course, Monet, Renoir, Caillebotte, Morisot, Cicely, Boudin, um, Basile, uh, Manet, uh, and I think that's it in the gallery. Um, uh, then we move to, again in the Impressionist period, we move to another, a third gallery dedicated to um, uh, the, with kind of a, a sociological approach, uh, the gallery is dedicated to the role and the, 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 the place of uh, women model in the uh, in Impressionist France and, and especially in the age and within the, 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 the work of uh, Edgar Degas and his uh, contemporaries. That gallery is also, so as I'm showing you here, that includes 
um, some, uh, uh, an amazing corpus of um, uh, uh, the waxes by Degas that Mr. Mellon was able to purchase in, uh, in the mid-1950s and which eventually got uh, scattered and, and given to uh, part to the National Gallery and a part to uh, VMFA. Um, then we move on to, a, again, in the, that same gallery, to a, a, gal a, a section dedicated to symbolism, focusing, um, organized around uh, two uh, amazing paintings by uh, Odilon Rodon. Uh, then we move to um, the what, fourth, uh, fourth gallery, uh, dedicated to post-impressionism, the movement that comes as a reaction against uh, the logic of, uh, of Impressionism around artists such as Van Gogh, uh, Gauguin. Uh, that gallery is also an opportunity for us to examine uh, the, the, the influence of and the, the impact on uh, art history that the School of pont aven organized around Gauguin had in the, in the end of the 1880s and the early 1890s. Um, so yeah, Van Gogh and, and, and Gauguin. Then we move on to a gallery dedicated to Fauvism. So we are reaching the beginning of the, of the 20th century around Matisse, Van Dongen, and, and Vlaminck, and work by some of the most important Fauve artists, Marquet, Derain, et cetera, uh, in, in the later part of their uh, uh, career. So yeah, Van Dongen and Matisse uh, in, the, in the early uh, 20th century. And then we move to uh, something, uh, uh, a section that I I'm, I'm particularly interested by, uh, which is dedicated to the Nabi group, this, the Nabi group born out of some of the, uh, out of the influence that Gauguin had on the young generation of artists in the late 80s and early 19th century, and uh, who decided to kind of create a union, a sort of group uh, called the Nabi group, Nabi meaning prophet in uh, Hebrew, and who considered themselves as prophets of a, of a new symbol, a sort of symbolistic uh, inspired um, uh, artistic movement that was supposed to completely renew the language of, of art. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Mellon collected a lot of um, uh, work by, by, by the Nabi uh, artists, especially Bonnard, Vuillard, Vallotton, and uh, including some of the works, and mostly actually some of the work by Bonnard, uh, Vuillard, and Vallotton from a period of their mature career. So after the 10 years of this Nabi movement uh, being kind of a factory of thinking and of, of creating in the very last decade of the 19th century, then in the 20th century, these artists kind of evolved into developing their uh, own style. And uh, late Bonnard and, uh, um, and, and, and Vuillard from the 20th century were artists that the Mellon particularly uh, favored, especially for their specific relation to uh, color. And then we move to the uh, last gallery of uh, Mellon French, uh, dedicated, divided into two parts, one, divided, one um, uh, dedicated to Mellon Cubism uh, around masterpieces of, um, uh, by Braque, by Picasso, as well as by Lafrenet, or like more um, uh, lesser known, but very, very fascinating artists like, v, like Jacques Villon, like uh, uh, Robert de Lafrenet. And um, the second part of that final gallery being dedicated to an artist also who the Mellon particularly favored, uh, kind of late Fauve uh, um, uh, artist who is uh, Raoul Dufy, an artist from the, the first half of the 20th century, very known for his uh, stenographic uh, style and, and friendship with, uh, with Matisse. So quite rich progression uh, into the, the, the history of, of French art from, as you saw, from the end of basically the Romantic movement um, until the, the very end of the Second uh, World War. And then the idea is that once you have uh, experienced this, this, this collection, which kind of results and, 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 and um, um, reveals their activity of collecting as a couple, you're invited then to move upstairs, uh, either to take the stairs or the elevator and discover and make a choice. And I keep saying make a choice. I hope that you will see both. But um, uh, first, uh, you have to choose what you begin with. Um, uh, first, um, the uh, collection of uh, Sporting Art, 
Um, it was also my decision to, and I think that's a, a, a difference from what used to be done um, previously, um, I, I decided to regroup British, French, and a few American paintings um, related to the art of the horse um, together into a new, more like pan-European, and not only pan-European because we have also American paintings in, uh, in, this, uh, in this display, kind of a pan, interna more international, I would say, uh, presentation. Um, into Sporting Art, we have three uh, galleries. The first one is the one that you see here, which is dedicated to the portraits of horses. I was interested to um, present and, and, and interrogate the, the conventions of representation of horses in the genre of sporting art from a period, in a period running from the 18th century to uh, the mid uh, 19th century. Then we have a second uh, gallery, the largest gallery dedicated to the uh, iconography of hunting. Um, and then we move on to a third gallery um, focusing on the iconography of um, horse uh, racing, which was a, a, a very, um, a very interesting opportunity for us to um, uh, reinterpret display and reinterpret uh, a, a fascinating um, collection, corpus of US, of American uh, 19th century uh, artworks which document the, the role, the part that uh, unfortunately African American slavery um, um, played in the training and the caring of horses for um, um, American pre-Civil War household. Uh, households, especially uh, here in uh, in the South, it's a it's a very poignant, absolutely fascinating collection of um, paintings, mostly by Troy, by Edward Troy, Swiss-born but active in um, uh, in the U.S. in kind of the two first first thirds of the um, uh, of the 19th century that really help uh, representing an aspect of the tragedy of enslavement in um, in in 19 pre-Civil War. Uh, America. And uh, here, for instance, I'm showing you uh, an example, I think one of the most impactful uh, of, of these paintings uh, representing a surrounding uh, horse undefeated asteroid, uh, a group of uh, three uh, um, enslaved uh, African Americans, uh, including a man named Anselm Williamson. It's very interesting because we, thanks to research done uh, by uh, my, my predecessors, we have a, a, a fairly good knowledge of who these people were. And it's been also a very interesting exercise of considering how we should, uh, of course, how we should interpret those paintings, but also, and the first way of interpreting being the title, being what, what kind of title should we give to these, um, uh, to these paintings, which initially focused on the identity of the horse, kind of leaving behind the uh, identity of the, of, the pe of the people attending the horse. And we have uh, switched the order of things and, and trying to put back in, in perspective the interest that these, uh, uh, the human figures represented on the pa those paintings had for a 20th, 20th century uh, audience. And um, as far as this painting is concerned, we know uh, two, uh, the identity of two of the, uh, of the persons represented. Uh, interestingly uh, uh, enough, Edward Brown, who's the, the young 14-year-old uh, uh, year uh, jockey represented here, we know uh, grew up into becoming an extremely successful, after the Civil War, obviously, uh, extremely successful uh, trainer of horses in, the, um, uh, in Kentucky, in Louisville, uh, Kentucky. And this display is a, a great opportunity for us to celebrate and to uh, reinterpret and put, I think, in, in, in the right context, one of the masterpieces of American Mellon, the American Mellon collection, which is uh, Eastman Johnson's A Right for Liberty for 18, from 1862, which is extraordinary uh, romantic painting um, that we know Eastman Johnson painted after having um, attended the, uh, the, the, this, this uh, um, uh, scene of, of, uh, in, the, in the context of the Civil War in, in Manassas, um, uh, witnessing a family 
um, on, on a horse, probably a horse that they would have captured uh, in, uh, in the context of the war, just running up north and, and, and trying to uh, save themselves and to uh, gain their uh, freedom. And I really wanted, I'm, I'm going back uh, a few um, images to uh, really compose this narrative around uh, what uh, uh, this, this collection of sporting art tells us about the, the, the tragedy of enslavement. In, uh, in this country in the 19th century. Mr. Mellon's collection uh, of sporting art also includes uh, those charming, uh, the charming collection of Hazeltine uh, sculptures. So this, this ensemble of art deco sculptures made by the American artist, uh, mostly active in, uh, in, in, in Europe, Herbert Hazeltine in, in the 1920s, initially made for the uh, Fields Museum in, uh, in Chicago, which the museum eventually deaccessioned, and Mr. Mellon jumped on the occasion to acquire them. He really loved those sculptures. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because we, we've, we've thought a lot about how to display them, how to think about the, the best place for them uh, to, to be there now on, on the third floor at the entrance of the Mellon Sporting Art Collection, which is actually exactly how Paul Mellon wanted it to be. Paul Mellon expressed in his will that the collection of Hazeltine were supposed to be an introduction to the sporting art collection. So at the moment of moving upstairs, moving the collection of sporting art upstairs, well, the, 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 the champion animals of England uh, um, followed, of course, and now they introduce the uh, sporting art. And then we move on to, so after Mr. Mellon, we, um, uh, or before, you really are uh, free to uh, choose the order of your experience of the collection, uh, then we move to the, uh, the Schlumberger uh, uh, galleries. Um, it was another very exciting, I think, um, exercise uh, to uh, conceive, as uh, Alex mentioned, that initially uh, in, in my previous posting I was, um, the, uh, I was curator of decorative arts and so I've, I've, I've often been used to think in terms of 3D and displaying and conceiving and thinking about scenographies of uh, 3D uh, objects and uh, it was particularly challenging, exciting, um, um, in, inspiring to think about um, the, the kind of unique style and spirit of um, the, the, the artwork of uh, Jean Schlumberger, this kind of unique, extravagant, late surrealist style that's turned into jewelry, decorative objects, that, and, and that were the result of, of course, his own culture of um, as I say, like kind of late, 19, late, late surrealist artist who turns into fashion and turns into uh, jewelry and, and decorative art at a time post World War II in the in the 60, mostly in the 60s and 70s, where uh, we, we we attend this moment of uh, the, maybe like the last generation of crazy aristocratic life. And we see in France, to, to describe the, the Schlumberger taste, we, we use often the term uh, bestegui. So it's the, the bestegui taste, of, uh, the name of the, the last extravagant collector of decorative arts and at the time, the Count de Bestegui. And it's, it was fascinating from a French perspective of a, an, an historian of, of uh, uh, French decorative arts to think about how to interpret this collection as the equivalent of the Bestigui taste in America at the time, which, which Tiffany actually, and Schumerger was a, an artistic director at Tiffany, so it, it's really associated to the, the, the development of Tiffany after the Second World War, um, uh, and also in relation to the, the, the personality of uh, Mrs. Mellon, especially her interest for uh, nature and uh, for, uh, specifically for uh, garden and design. This was also a great occasion to display the uh, collection of Schlumberger drawing that came to the museum as a gift uh, in, the, in the late uh, 1980s to accompany the gift uh, that she made of her um, um, decorative objects uh, designed by uh, Schlumberger. So back to uh, two symbols, I think, of the, of the Mellon collection, Impressionism and uh, Sporting Art. The, the new Mellon galleries are, um, of course, a new way for us at VMFA to pay tribute to the importance of the Mellon collection, to the importance of its, its gift to the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. 
And it's, it's a commitment to display a clear and rich experience of artistry for uh, our, our public. Um, with this in mind, um, I uh, thought, so having in mind the fact that we, as an encyclopedic museum, we were committed to present the Mellon Collection as, as a group, but to present the Mellon Collection as a way to talk about the history of, of art uh, of, of, of Europe, mostly of Europe in, in this period. And having this in mind, I included a limited number of additions to the Mellon Collection within this uh, new uh, uh, display. Um, we, we did that in agreement with the Mellon uh, will and the Mellon, the principle of the Mellon do donation, which uh, allowed for a limited number of non-Mellon artwork uh, into the display of, of the Mellon collection, assuming that the works would be of equal quality to what the Mellon were gifting, to, to the museum, and assuming that the works would help contextualize the importance of the Mellon pieces themselves. And so it was, I think, um, in, in this framework of, of mind, um, it, it was clear to me that some additions that we could make would definitely help enrich and, 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 and serve and be at the service of the logic of the Mellon Collection and the way the Mellon Collection could be rightly interpreted by, um, uh, by uh, our public. Um, there are several cases, uh, interesting cases, I think, of additions that uh, we uh, were able to make, and I'm, I'm going to mention them and add and, and, and mention a, uh, an example per, per case. Uh, first of all, we had work in our European collection that were not Mellon, but from the same period of, of, uh, as, as the one uh, covered by, by the Mellon collection, and whose integration would help uh, tremendously illustrating the understanding of uh, art history provided by the, by the Mellon display. Uh, an example of that, of an, an addition that I really, really wanted to make to, to the Mellon collection was this absolutely gorgeous uh, Monet irises by, the, by, by a pond, uh, representation of course by the, of, of the pond of uh, his, his pond at, at Giverny, which is a painting made uh, in the context of the First World War, part of that extraordinary set that Monet is working on during the First World War, at the time Monet has become the, the iconic uh, paint, French painter at the time, very much involved with the government. His friendship with Georges Clemenceau is very well known, and he conceives of that cycle of uh, paintings, Les Nymphéas, that he proposes to the French government to present to the French government for when the time comes, we are in between 1915 and 1917, for when the time comes that France is going to win the, uh, the, the, the war. And, and it's very well known that this cycle eventually made its way uh, as a gift of Monet to the, to the French nation. And it's now conserved at the Musée de l'Orangerie. Interestingly enough, um, Monet didn't give the entire set of paintings that he did in that context. He kept some of them and the heirs of Monet when he died in the, in the 1920s um, sold some of those paintings that were uh, that left in uh, his studio and luckily VMFA has uh, one of them. It's a painting that uh, was acquired by the museum in 1971. Also it, it in order to contextualize the logic of, it, of making some integrations into the new Mellon collection, uh, a painting acquired in 1971 would have been acquired at a moment when Paul Mellon was extremely involved as member of the board of this museum. So it's not like we, uh, add, we were adding something that he didn't see, that he didn't, that he didn't support the acquisition of. Um, and the reason, of course, why I think it's, it's fabulous, I mean, of course, because of the extreme quality and importance of that huge painting, but also because it helps contextualizing the place, the role of the two other Monet paintings that we have received from, from, the, from the Mellon collection, uh, namely Camille at the window, representation of his wife at the window of their um, a house in Argenteuil, which is a again, an absolute masterpiece by Monet, documenting an early phase of his work, kind of the moment when, when, when Monet, the Impressionist, really develops his style. We're just one year before the famous exhibition that will 
uh, create the name Impressionist in 1874 after a critic uh, confessed that he didn't understand the meaning of that painting, Impression Soleil Levant, leading to I don't understand this Impressionism. Uh, which eventually ended up becoming the name uh, of the, that group of, of radical painters, which used to be called before that the Independent, the, the, the Independence. And then we have the second uh, painting, which is a representation of Giverny, so about a decade later, and which documents the second phase of, uh, a second phase of uh, um, uh, Monet's life and, and career when he moves away from Argenteuil uh, to uh, uh, go back to his uh, native Normandy um, in, uh, in the, in the um, uh, small town, small village of uh, Giverny. It's after the death of his wife, Camille. And, uh, and, and, and so we have this iconic representation of Giverny. So, so we, you, we see that the integration and here you see the, 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 the Impressionist gallery and they, they, they work so well uh, uh, together uh, in order to provide a, a chronology, like a logic idea of how uh, Monet was Monet in the different steps of his uh, life and, and career. Uh, another kind types of uh, insertion of, of, of additions to, to the Mellon collection that I think was uh, uh, very meaningful, very important, were important acquisitions that we would make um, uh, in, uh, of underrepresented uh, artworks in uh, the uh, collection. Uh, but that would, of course, help understand and again contextualize the importance of Mellon pieces. Uh, and the example I'm uh, mentioning uh, here is this uh, fabulous, uh, fantastic, I'm just so happy that we, <laughs> that we acquired it uh, in uh, 2020. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> it's just wonderful. Um, it's this uh, painting, The Three Pond Cottage at Le Poule du by uh, Paul Serrusier, which is um, I really want to stress it. It's, it's, it's an extremely important painting on the path between um, uh, 19th century art on, on the way, on the path to uh, modernist uh, painting. Paul Serrusier is this young artist who uh, trained uh, classically in an academic uh, school um, uh, in, in, in Paris and eventually in 1888 and then in 1889 decides to, to make the trip to Brittany to meet with Paul Gauguin and to really get infused by the uh, lessons that Paul Gauguin, of, of the style that Paul Gauguin decides to uh, implement for his own uh, art in, in his sort of exile, voluntary exile. In, uh, in, in Brittany at the time. And Serrusier comes back from all those lessons um, uh, to his friends in Paris. And with his friends in Paris, we have Bonnard, Vuillard, uh, Kerzavier Roussel, Maurice Denis, etc. And they, out from everything that he received from Gauguin, will for, were to form the Nabi group that I was mentioning uh, earlier. I'm, I'm not developing too much on, on Serrusier. Fascinating artist. What's happening in 1888, 1889, at nine with, in Brittany with Serrusier painting alongside Gauguin and kind of feeding himself from the lessons of, of the master is a, a wonderful subject. I, I did a lecture on, uh, on this painting uh, uh, last year and I think the lecture is still uh, available if you want to know more um, on, uh, on YouTube and on uh, our uh, website. Definitely as you uh, will understand. So, of course, we, we, I, I placed the painting in the gallery dedicated to post-impressionism, um, um, of course, associated to the works of Paul Gauguin, to the contemporary work of Van Gogh uh, as well. And it's a wonderful, wonderful way to really provide the public with a, a possibility to understand the roots of the aesthetics of the Nabi paintings that we received from uh, from, from uh, Paul and uh, Bonnie Mellon, especially uh, by Vuillard, by Bonnard, uh, as I'm uh, showing you uh, here the most, I think, uh, telling uh, examples. Um, and then uh, another uh, interesting uh, aspect where the aspect of, you know, kinds of um, uh, integration within the Mellon collection where on the occasions of very generous loans that were agreed upon, agreed on by other departments, curatorial departments of, of VMFA, uh, because it, 
it spanned from the 19th century to, to, the, to the mid 20th century. The Mellon Collection is kind of a, situates itself at the end of a chronological span, the chronological span of European art, and at the birth, as you can imagine, of the collection of uh, modern and contemporary uh, art. And so there were opportunities of very interesting collaborative uh, approaches. And a painting I want to mention uh, here is this um, extraordinary. Um, painting cherry picking by uh, Albert uh, André, which is a painting dating from 1906, uh, which uh, belongs, in fact, when it was it was acquired by uh, by the museum, uh, was kind of because it was it was considered to be dating from 1912. I've, I've never understood why this date of 1912, because actually uh, it's a painting that we know was exhibited at the Salon d'Automne of 1906 and dates from, from 1905, 1906. And at the time it was acquired, it was uh, automatically put in the collection of modern and contemporary art. When you see the painting, you understand that this is not really a piece of modern and contemporary art certainly not a piece of contemporary art, and that it's, it's not, um, uh, it would not be a painting that would probably attract the interest of a curator of, of, uh, of contemporary art, uh, art who have has so many more uh, uh, objects and, and uh, uh, logics of collecting uh, more important, I guess. Um, so um, the idea was for us to, to ask um, to our uh, colleagues in the Department of Contemporary Art to um, if they would agree to uh, lend it, and I'm really thankful to uh, Valerie Castle Oliver and Sarah Eckhart for agreeing to, to that. Um, Albert André is a very interesting uh, late Impressionist artist who I wanted in the collection because of his uh, connection with Renoir. He was a, a mentee. Renoir was, was, was Albert André's uh, mentor, and we have with this painting a, a, a very interesting example of uh, what late Impressionism can, uh, can, can uh, evoke. And uh, here you see it's a gorgeous, very large painting. It was extremely well cleaned and uh, uh, restored by uh, our uh, Mellon conservator, uh, Meredith Watson. And uh, here you can see it displayed alongside uh, Mellon uh, Renoir. I kind of wanted to create that, that bond uh, within our, our galleries. Um, and another example of integration is um, uh, again, and again, we are talking about Nabi uh, uh, period. I wanted um, uh, to, I wished, uh, a, um, uh, a, to, to integrate a piece of Art Nouveau decorative arts into the Nabi, uh, the demonstration about the, 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 the Nabi style and, and the Nabi movement in order to show the, 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 the correspondences, the parallelism and the kind of ongoing dialogue that exists around 1900 in the last decades, uh, decade of the, of the 19th century between the logic of the decorative arts uh, from the Art Nouveau period and uh, what, uh, what's going on in the mind of the, of the Nabi artists like Bonnard, Vuillard, etc., um, who were very much promoting the idea of canceling the logic of hierarchy between fine arts and decorative arts, between painting, sculpture, and, uh, and, and, and decorative arts in, in general. I think we needed really um, uh, something to convey that uh, idea, and uh, my wonderful colleague Barry Schiffman were very, was very supportive of the idea of selecting a piece, and in that context, this wonderful uh, Majorel uh, Buffet, uh, dating exactly from the period of, of, the, of the Nabi, very representative as most Majorel uh, pieces of the Art Nouveau period, very much representative of common sources of inspiration, like, for instance, the Japanese, Jap Japanese movement. Um, uh, that uh, was all the rage at, at the time in terms of uh, references and sources of, of inspiration. So thank you very much, Barry, for, uh, for agreeing to, to this loan. And finally, uh, the la last case of, of additions that um, I um, uh, wanted to, to develop were cases of external loan to uh, our collection, uh, very much associated with the Mellon collection. and. Uh, in, 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 namely, uh, I negotiated with uh, the Yale Paul Mellon Center of uh, British Art the loan of two portraits of Paul Mellon. I kind of wanted always in this, in this idea of integrating uh, elements that could help us 
um, document their lives and who the Mellons uh, were. And we obtained the loan of two portraits, including this wonderful um, portrait, equestrian portrait of Paul Mellon, uh, dating from his early years in, in 1933 by uh, Sir Alfred uh, Munnings. He's um, riding his uh, favorite horse of the time, Dublin, who, which he had received as a, a gift from his uh, uh, mother. And so, uh, by presenting those editions, I just wanted to uh, understand, to, to have people understanding their logic and that we are, by doing so, we were always doing that, keeping in mind the, the commitment to honor and uh, honor the legacy of the Mellon and illustrate the quality and the relevance and the importance of uh, their uh, collection and, and their gift. Um, so now in this presentation, I uh, also, something I really wanted to share and which kind of was the, 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 the initial idea when proposing our education department to do a lecture on, uh, on the reinstallation, not on the Mellon collection, but on the reinstallation of the Mellon collection, was because I wanted to share some behind the scenes, some kind of elements of the experience the from the perspective of the curator, what is wonderful in terms of collaboration at the moment of reinstalling something of the ambition of the importance of, of, the, of the Mellon collection. Um, so a few photos um, uh, sh showing some of the chronology of what we've been doing over the past uh, two years. It's been a long process, two years. Two years is long and short at the same time, depending the perspective you have on, on, on things. We, we began, I began working um, um, on, on, on the project in the summer of 2019 when it became clear that I was moving from Montreal to, uh, to, to, to Richmond. So I actually started working on, on it uh, as soon as I hung up, hung up the phone with Michael. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> knowing that I would get the job. Um, and, uh, and then, so summer of 2019, I, I arrived in, in, the, in the fall of 2019. The construction started very, I mean, the construction had started much, much earlier than my arrival. And so the, the painting and the first steps of the, of the reflections of what we were going to do uh, started in the late 2019 and early 2020. Uh, and it was a lot of, of thinking, obviously, uh, from, from, from me, uh, a lot of drafting. I draft a lot, all the time, and uh, hoping that people will understand the different drawings that I would uh, present them. And it was a lot of thinking about how to compose, how to organize uh, the different sections that I uh, and, and envisions, envisioned. Um, something we always love to do as curators. I don't know of a curator colleague that does, who doesn't love to do that is working with the, the maquettes, the 3D models at the, as the first step um, uh, that, that we use is always we have uh, someone from design, Mike uh, Kennison, uh, who uh, conceives those, those wonderful models. And, uh, and so the early, in early 2020, the early step was uh, to, to work with these um, um, models and placing like, you know, like kind of little stamps, um, uh, adhesive little stamps, placing the, the, the works to kind of have a first feeling, sentiment, you know, understanding of how things would react to each other and how things would look from a very early, um, you know, as, as good as a model can be, a model that's basically that big can be. But it's, it's a very important, interesting uh, uh, beginning of, of the process. Um, and uh, here I'm showing you, for instance, I, I, I like doing that, like taking uh, photos of what we We were not very far away. Huh? You, you see the, the first initial uh, uh, presentation of the, the, the most important, so the Renoir, Monet, Caillebotte, uh, Monet again. Um, Cicely and, and Boudin, and eventually what, it, what they turned out to be. I think it's, it's pretty close, not completely, but um, uh, it was already pretty close. I think it's a, it's a wall that I had sort of in mind very early on in the, in the process. Here you see um, an example of the model of the sporting art uh, uh, galleries, and which I'm showing you so in, very interesting in terms of thinking and changing our minds so many times. Uh, we we had we had a lot of um, discussions around what what to do with this sort of uh, with this big large gallery, which is which is a great gallery, but that I wanted to modulate as as much as possible. And so we went on discussing different kinds of 
architectural additions. Um, and initially, there was the idea of having a sort of round space, which, as you can tell, turned out, I mean, was not very a great idea, would have placed a very heavy uh, structure in the, in the middle of that beautiful gallery. And so we ended up, at some point, um, 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 opting for the idea of independent freestanding walls, which create, I think, a, the, what I think is a, is, is a very nice um, uh, architectural experience for the gallery dedicated to hunting uh, in, within the, the, the sporting art with the possibility of opening, of kind of multiplying the um, uh, expe visual experiences of, of the art and, and creating different perspectives uh, in, uh, in the gallery. Um, and then when I was talking about sketches, and just, I have dozens, if not hundreds, of those little <laughs> uh, designs. Then after working with the model, um, it's the it, it's part it's the job of our uh, colleague uh, designers to turn them into uh, 2D maps and using softwares to um, uh, to to create those, those those maps and those plans. And then it's a back and forth between the curator and the and the designers about um, uh, changing our mind basically and kind of adapting everything that that we do and and this is a very long process and I think it's uh, which is why I was saying that I was we were very fortunate eventually to have a, one more year to really develop uh, the, the, the the project of, of this play and it's been a very long ongoing process of um, adapting refining the narrative refining the narrative from a from an intellectual artistry perspective, but also from a, from an aesthetical uh, uh, point of view, um, and um, it's, it was very intense, but very very fruitful and very interesting. And I'm I'm, I'm very admirative of how they were able to understand all those little uh, drawings and, and documents that I would keep sending them back. Incidentally, you 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 understand that the gallery, the the impressionist gallery, is actually named. Gallery 251 uh, here, um, and um, one. Um, uh, so yeah, many steps in in the process of of perfecting a, a, a display, refining it uh, over and and over. I think one idea in terms of displaying a collection really should should prevail is that. We do things by steps, of course, but that the final decision, we do things so that we understand that the, the final decision will always be the moment when we have the real works. Like we work from a vi virtual perspective on, uh, on, on paper, on models, etc. but having in mind that uh, we, uh, uh, we, uh, have, we wait, we look forward to the moment when finally the works are um, um, at hand in the gallery and well, this is really where the magic happens. And I think it's, it's always very important to keep in mind that, um, that, that fact. And so a, a profession uh, 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 that is absolutely essential in this, in this work is of course our wonderful team of art handlers who work so much into making everything happen, being extremely professional in the manipulation of, of the works. And here, for instance, I'm showing you um, an, an example of before and after uh, the installation, in particular, of the, uh, of the Impressionist uh, gallery. It's it's a photo. Um, it's a photo that I'm, I'm very happy for sharing because to share because um, it was definitely one of the most exciting and a moving uh, moment when you see moving up on the wall so many impressionist masterpieces like for Monet, a Caillebotte, a Renoir from the best period and a, 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 a Sisley together. It, at, at that moment, I remember that it was a particularly um, uh, moving and, and spectacular uh, instant of that whole adventure. Um, Um, and then, and I, I think I'm, I'm going to, to conclude on, on this, um, I, a question that I've been asked so far and over the time that I've been able to, to tour the collection with our first uh, members of, of, of the public uh, has been a lot of questions that I've received have uh, concerned the, I've been concerned the choice of uh, wall colors for, for these new, new galleries. And this is something I wanted to, to, to evoke uh, within, within this, this talk. How do we select uh, the colors for, uh, for, for wall galleries in, in general? 
why picking specifically uh, this, this, uh, this color? It's been a very interesting aspect of, of this reinstallation. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's, it's interesting from the creative perspective. It's also interesting from the perspective of how it situates, situates us uh, curators within a, a long tradition of history of, of curating and, and history of, of museums. Um, the 20th century has developed uh, the, the, the concept for its museum, the concept of wide cube, which in, in many ways, in many senses, evolved in what I used to, I'm used to call the gray cube, uh, which is run by the idea, and, and, and it's an idea that definitely makes some sense, and I, I just, it makes sense, I, I just wanna be clear about that. It's the idea that the museum gallery space should provide an environment as neutral as possible in order to allow an uncompromised encounter and understanding experience of the art itself by, by the public. Um, it's, it's also very much associated with the logic of favoring daylight, especially daylight coming from uh, like zenithal daylight as the best way to light a painting and to, and to experience a painting. Um, and here, for instance, I'm showing you um, uh, 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 one of the galleries of the Met uh, in, in New York, which I think is interesting to show you because you see a Monet painting very similar to the one that, that we have belonging to that same uh, group of um, uh, World War I compositions. Um, it's also the case uh, that you can see at the Art Institute of Chicago, for instance, that you can, you can see at, at the National Gallery. It's, it's very interesting from, a, from an historical perspective for the history of museums because we want to bear in mind that this is the theory of display that corresponds to the lifetime of, of the melons when they um, uh, began discussing uh, the, uh, the gift of, of their collection to, to VMFA and here. I'm showing you um, uh, views of the, the previous galleries of, of the Mellon Collection, and we see that the, uh, the, the concept of the Grey Cube was definitely in the mind of, uh, of, 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 the, of the museum people uh, at, uh, at the time to ensure very clearly the sort of neutrality of the gallery at the moment of displaying masterpieces on, uh, on, the, on the wall. Interestingly, and I think this is something we see in the previous uh, presentation of, of sporting art, we see that it was accompanied by some commitment to colored space, uh, spaces such as here in, in sporting art with this powerful red which I think emphasized the formality of the type of art that was displayed there, the 19th century Victorian red that kind of probably uh, uh, spoke to, to the logic of displaying sporting art in, in a gallery uh, like that. Um, I have to say that I belong to a generation of curators that tries to envision new ways of highlighting the experience of the artworks uh, within the museum space. Yes, the gallery is at the service of the art. There's absolutely no question about that. But there are ways to invent new manners of being at the service of, of the art and of the, the collection. And one of these envisionings is to consider that color isn't an enemy of uh, a, a respectful experience of the art and, and the collection. Uh, colors in their intensity, uh, in, in the drama that they uh, produce, that they bring to a space, in, in also their variety and then their complementarity uh, offer, I think, a very, can offer a very stimulating uh, effect and experience for, for the viewer. So a very early reflection that I uh, undertook, and, and, and especially I have to say, uh, uh, thanks with, with the help of one of our designers, uh, Dan Linder, was to conceive a color program, a uh, color scheme that would suit as best as possible the succession of uh, galleries that we were uh, thinking, thinking about. In, in the, the chronological walkthrough proposed, noted especially by the impressionist uh, uh, galleries, and also, in the, in the thematic set of galleries of sporting art, which I wanted to look, I have to say, as, as British as possible, uh, as, as welcoming also, as unintimidating as, uh, as, as possible for our um, uh, viewers. Uh, it was also 
part of the, 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 you know, the reflections around the, the selection of a very dark uh, ambiences for the extravaganza of uh, Schlumberger's jewelry, for which I think we needed an ambience as dramatic as possible for the pieces to really sparkle. Um, so the ambition was to uh, provide a museum space that where the visitor would feel warmly welcome, where we want, where he or she would want to stay in, to come back many times, to kind of build a, a, a kind of relationship with with the space, um, and 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 to feel, I think, at peace for a contemplation. Of, of the art, to ensure that the space is not cold, is not, again, intimidating uh, or artificially uh, formal, and also to create a space that aspires to be, I think, intellectually, but also aesthetically uh, stimulating. And um, all these questions around the wall colors, I think, are, are very much fascinating, and I've been really happy to to to, to work on on those uh, on those concepts as from the from a curatorial perspective, because I think they really provide uh, new ways to serve the artworks themselves by breaking with with the logic uh, logic of the of the gray cube. We have. Uh, I think looked for the the best uh, use the best the best colors that adapt that would adapt to the uh, works uh, themselves and to provide the best way for them to really unquestionably uh, shine. Um, a few examples on that, for instance, uh, of course, oop, and I'm going back there. Um, the impressionist gallery with. Uh, what a colleague of mine this morning described as a cranberry, cranberry gallery, um, uh, which, which is this, this color, this kind of purple color that we selected after very careful consideration of how best to highlight the green and the blues of some of those paintings, uh, as well as actually the purple uh, color of, of the Monet, but what we see here with the Caibot and with the, with the Monet, we, we, we needed a color that would, that would react very well, and I think the burgundy uh, color, uh, the cranberry color, worked uh, well in, in that regard. Same, same for the, the green and the browns of the post-impressionist gallery for which we have uh, opted for this terracotta uh, gallery. And then, uh, last example, uh, in order for, to provide an opportunity for the paintings to really shine as, as, go as good as, as, the, as they can, the idea of selecting this dark uh, gray for the, uh, the Nabi period, when you have a movement, an artistic movement that is particularly so much focusing on color for their paintings, you, you want, and I, I think it's, it's better, I think it works much better on a, a dark ground rather than on a lighter gray or, or white uh, wall. Um, uh, also conceiving a stimulating display means uh, thinking about dynamic interactions that has always been, I think, a very fun, a very nice uh, exercise that I uh, was invited to do uh, here. Uh, so thinking about dynamic interactions that one can implement in, in the display so that the artworks react to each other, not only from a, a historical perspective of the idea of a course of, on the chronology of art, but also by dialoguing nicely with, with each other, which I think um, uh, very early on I wanted definitely the Monet to be placed next to this wonderful Renoir, not only because you have a, this very interesting um, as a visual interaction between, between the two for what they represent, but also because by doing so, we're associating a very early Impressionist painting, which is the um, Pensive painting by Renoir from the uh, mid-1850s, with a late Impressionist uh, Monet from, from the later part of his career. So it's a kind of a way to kind of buckle the buckle. And um, uh, in, in, I think, an, an, an interesting um, uh, aesthetic um, uh, manner of, of display. Um, also by ensuring um, the right distribution of formats of paintings or by facilitating interactions uh, between two-dimensional art 
and so paintings mostly, and 3D works uh, like uh, sculptures, uh, which is, for example, what I'm showing you with these um, uh, Degas um, uh, works, the Degas um, uh, wax. And I see, oh my God, I've been very long. Uh, so sorry, uh, I'm concluding on, on this. Um, Welcome to the Mellon Galleries. I want to say, if you haven't seen them already, I, I hope you like them. I hope you will come, and you will come back again and again and again. They are yours, and uh, this is how the Mellons wanted it uh, to, to, to be here at VMFA. Thank you very much.